Today is going to be a fantastic day. Not only is it a crisp, cool 4th of July morning, but the first PC boards are back from the fab. Let's put one together and try it out. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. As you know, I am in the middle of developing an electronic lead screw for my lathe, which is a device that replaces the change gears with an electronic controller and a motor. Now, so far, the electronics that you've seen in these videos are built up on a breadboard, and that's great for an initial prototype, it's great for a proof of concept, but it is not great for long-term use in a shop environment. That's just a temporary solution, and we need to do something better for the long term. Uh, in fact, just this week, I was making a new camera mount for one of my C stands and some chips flew off of the lathe and landed on the microcontroller board. Now, fortunately, nothing was damaged, but it just underscores the point that this is not appropriate for a shop environment. It is high time that we get some PC boards made and get these electronics buttoned up and in an enclosure so they can survive in this environment. This is Circuit Maker. This is the software that I'm going to use to design the PC boards. Um, this is basically the free version of Altium Designer, and being free, it has some limitations. It has full schematic capture, full PC board design. There aren't really many limits there, but all of the projects that you create in Circuit Maker are publicly hosted in the cloud and visible to other people. And so that's the primary limitation if you were thinking about using this for a commercial project. Now, in my case, what I'm building here is open source hardware, so that's perfect. I did also consider using Eagle. I took a look at it, especially since it's been acquired by Autodesk and it's kind of in the same software family with Fusion 360. But the free version of Eagle has the limitation that it can't be used for commercial purposes. So you can't design a PC board and then sell them and still be in compliance with the license. So let's jump in here. I've got go over to my projects and open up the electronic lead screw here. This is the schematic for the PC board and let's just uh, go through what's in here. So over here on the left are the connectors for the booster pack. These are the headers that attach the board down to the microcontroller prototyping board. Um, there's two of them, 20 pins each, and this is where all the signals of the microcontroller are coming from. We've got power and ground, and then all of the GPIO and uh, SPI lines that we're using. And instead of drawing this all out, I've just labeled these with net names. Then uh, next over here are the level converters. So these are the signals that come from the microcontroller that are 3.3 volt logic, and the other side that goes out to the display, which is 5 volt logic. And this is exactly the same as the uh, circuit that I had drawn on paper with a Sharpie when I was going over this in a previous video. I've just captured it here so that we can use it for the PC board design. So this is a normal uh, open collector or open drain uh, level converter using a uh, simple MOSFET. Um, and I've done a couple of versions of this. These are BSS 138s. And then over here is the connector for the display. So these signals that are coming out of the level converters are then going to the pin header for the display. Likewise, uh, this is the connector for the stepper or servo driver. And then these are the MOSFET amplifiers to drive the optocouplers to drive the step direction and enable lines for that. Um, I've also got an input here for the alarm signal back from a servo in case you're using a servo and it has that. I haven't implemented any of this in software, but I figured I'd go ahead and put the circuitry here. And then this is the pull up and filtering for that input back to a GPIO. And then I've also decided to put power on this board as well. So we'll feed in power through a barrel connector here. And then I've got a voltage regulator that'll take the 5 volts from the external power supply and provide the regulated 3.3 volts that's needed for the microcontroller. Got a couple of LEDs down here to show the, uh, the status of the power so we can make sure that it's on. And then the one thing that I've added here, this microcontroller does not have erasable uh, uh, non-volatile memory for storing settings. 
I may want to have that at one point, so I went ahead and put an EEPROM chip in here as well. And these are really inexpensive, they're like 40 cents at volume. So I just wanted to have this as an option for the future. Even if we don't end up using it, I just leave that part of the board unpopulated. So that's the schematic. The next step is to take this and push it over to the PC board design. I've already done that and I've already laid out the board. Now, I have tried to make this as compact as possible. The microcontroller board has two sets of these pin headers and the way this works is there's a uh, the connectors on the bottom and the board just pushes down on top of the microcontroller and then it, these pins feed through so that you can stack more boards on top that use other pins similar to the hat system for the raspberry pi or the shield system for the arduino now i've tried to keep this board as small as possible ti has something that they call the booster pack spec which is for small boards in exactly this form factor that are made to snap on the top of their launch pad uh, microcontroller boards. And the idea is that if everybody does them the same size, then they can all stack together and operate together. And so as you can see, this is pretty tight. I opted to go with the surface mount components for the first prototype just because of how tight the board is. So here are the six MOSFET transistors across here with their supporting resistors and capacitors. This is the voltage regulator and the filter caps for that. The power LEDs and their resistors and then the EEPROM chip down here. And then I've got all of the connectors up on the top. So this is a Phoenix connector to connect to the servo, a pin header to connect to the uh, display and then the barrel connector for power input. Now I did do a through hole version of this board. Let me open that up here. Um, and this is exactly the same circuitry, but these are through hole versions of all of the components. So I've got TO92 transistors. I've got an eight pin dip for the EEPROM and then through hole versions of all the capacitors and the resistors. Now this is extremely tight. These are not standard quarter watt resistors. These are, I think, uh, eighth watt or 10th watt resistor so these are little tiny things that are wedged in here uh, you can see by comparison these are uh, tenth uh, inch header pins so uh, this is extremely tight I did stick with the surface mount uh, voltage regulator because that seemed like that would be easy to solder uh, by hand and the same with the barrel connector because it has these big tabs on the side uh, to be honest, I'm not sure what the future holds for the through hole board. Uh, this is certainly something that I could make available if there's enough interest. This is so crowded though, that it's not necessarily going to be that easy to solder. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to start with the surface mount board because if I do end up making these in volume, this is the design I'm going to want to use. I sent this design off to the fab and through the magic of planning ahead, the boards are already back. So let's go out to the shop take a look, assemble one, and see how it works. Well, these are the boards as they came packaged from the fab. Now, I had these made at uh, JLC PCB, which is offshore in Shenzhen. Uh, the reason I chose them is not because I have any affiliation with them, I don't, or because they pay me, they don't. I paid full price for these boards. But the particular combination of the size, the number of boards I wanted, and the features, specifically the red solder mask and the lead-free hassle finish, um, they had kind of the best price and could turn them quickly. So that's who I went with. Like I said, I've got no experience with them. We'll see as we assemble these uh, how they look. They look pretty good so far. Um, I'm pretty impressed with the quality. They look, you know, they look fine, nothing spectacular. I think the OSH Park boards made in, in the US are maybe a little bit better, but um, again, for the pricing and uh, for the solder mask color I wanted, uh, this was a better option for this particular project. Um, I'm pretty happy. Uh, these look really good. Now, uh, I could solder these by hand. I didn't use extended pads on these to make it easy to solder by hand because my intention is to solder these with uh, solder paste and a reflow oven. And so to that end, I also ordered from the fab a solder paste stencil. Now this is just a sheet of about five thou thick or five and a half thou thick stainless steel with holes cut in it for the pads where solder needs to be applied for all the surface mount components. 
So if I lay this on top of the board, you can see it's possible to line it up so that the pads show through exactly. And then once this is lined up, you basically silk screen or just squeegee the solder onto it, and that puts solder onto all the pads of the board. Now, getting this lined up and getting this lined up repeatedly is uh, you know, a complex task. And so I made a jig to make this easier because of course I did. So this is just a piece of aluminum tooling plate with a pocket cut out in it that fits the PC board. In fact, it's machined to within about a thousandth of an inch to fit the PC board exactly. Now this fits in level so that the surface of the board is exactly level with the surface of the tooling plate. So then I can take the stencil and place it over the top exactly. Now let me get this positioned exactly where I want it. You can probably see this better than I can because I'm working with a camera in my way. And then once I have that exactly where I want it, I can tape it down to the fixture. Now with that aligned and taped down, now I can just lift it up, take the board out, put another one in, and the stencil will realign perfectly and I can squeegee the solder paste onto that. So I can just run these through like a little production line. But today, I'm only gonna do one. Okay, so let me put that in there. Let me get some solder paste. Now, I did not want to work under a microscope and try to drag the microscope down here with uh, everything else I've got going on with the cameras. So I'm just gonna work here today with a jeweler's visor. Okay, so this is uh, lead-free solder paste. This is, uh, happens to be chip quick, and you can maybe read the part number on there. Uh, this is uh, SAC 305, which is just sort of the standard uh, lead-free solder paste. Um, I've played with this stuff a little bit, and I've been pretty happy. Kind of stir this up. And we're only going to do one board, so I don't need a ton. So I'll just put a little bit here on the stencil. That's probably plenty, but I want to make sure I have enough that I don't have to get some more. And then I will just squeegee that on. You can use a credit card or a little piece of plastic. This is actually a squeegee sold by Chipquick specifically for this purpose. Believe it or not, they sell it in about $2 but it's worth it because it, it's got a nice crisp edge and it works really well. Let me kind of squeegee this across. Make sure I get it in all the holes. If I had a proper, you know, solder paste application machine, this would be easier, but I'm not doing enough boards to justify that. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. Let's lift up the stencil and see what we've got. Okay, that looks great. I've got paste on all of the points there. All the pads are covered. They look like they're about the same thickness. My calibrated eyeballs say that's about five thou, which is exactly what we need. Let me get this cleaned up and get some components and we can uh, place them. So I have a blown up version of the board here on paper with all the components labeled so I know what I'm doing and I will just work through these one by one, placing them on the board. Okay, we'll start with the transistors. I'll just flip these out onto the mat here. Now the good news is these don't have to be placed perfectly. 
because the solder paste, the surface tension will pull them into position when this gets reflowed. So this is very difficult doing this working around the camera. Hopefully I'll be able to get this to work. Ironically, you can probably see this better than I can. Oops. Okay, next up is the 10K resistors. These are 0603 components, so they are quite small. Well, this is way easier to do under a microscope. Hopefully this is going to work anyway. Okay, next up are the three 1K resistors. Not being particularly careful with these, I'm really hoping that the surface tension will pull them into position. Generally, I'm a little more careful when I do this under a microscope because I can see better. Okay, now the 47 picofarad capacitors. We need seven of those. Next up, the 680 ohm resistor for the Five volt LED. Now the three hundred thirty ohm resistor for the three point three volt LED. Now the LEDs themselves. Now these, of course, are directional, so I have to make sure I'm putting them in the right way. A voltage regulator. And these are the 4.7 microfarad filter capacitors. A bypass capacitor for the EEPROM. Now we have the EEPROM itself. Let me find the mark and make sure I'm putting this on in the correct orientation. Okay, that looks good. And then I think the last part we have is the power connector. That's actually the only part I can put on without tweezers. Okay, I think that is it. Let me kind of look this over, make sure everything looks all right to me in terms of placement.
Okay, that all looks good. Let me get the reflow oven set up and let's solder this thing. So I have my reflow oven set up here, and if this looks to you a lot like a toaster oven, that is because it's a toaster oven. Uh, this is just an inexpensive, like a $30 toaster oven that I picked up at a local store, and then I converted it into a reflow oven using a Controlio 3 uh, reflow oven controller. This is just a microcontroller touchscreen board with software for controlling a reflow oven. There's a thermocouple installed inside here along with a bunch of additional insulation. We've got Nomex seal around the door. All of the uh, inside, all of the cracks, all of the openings in the sheet metal have been sealed. There's a ceramic fiber blanket in here for insulation. And then all of the electronics, such as they were, have been replaced with um, solid state relays that are connected to this controller. So with the thermocouple and the solid state relays, it's controlling the three elements in this oven to run a reflow profile for soldering. And so specifically, I'm using a 250 degrees Celsius uh, lead-free paste profile. And I'm going to try to get some shots of the reflow process for you. That's why I got the extra lights and the cameras all in the way. So let me slide this in here carefully so I don't disturb where I set my focus. Close the door. And let's see, can you see that? I think you can. And let's start the reflow. Okay, the first phase is a pre-soak, and it's just gonna heat the oven up to about 75 degrees Celsius. I know there's nothing really to see yet, but I've got my macro lens set up here, pointed through the window. I think I've got the focus set properly. I've got a bunch of extra light in here. So I'm hoping you'll get to see the solder paste as it actually reflows and the components settle into position. And uh, I actually bought this lens specifically to get this shot. So hopefully the heat from the oven doesn't turn this into a $400 mistake. Okay, the oven just hit 75 degrees Celsius. And so now it's going to ramp the oven up to 150 degrees Celsius over about 80 seconds. Again, this is just following a reflow profile and the profile for a particular solder paste will come in the documentation of the data sheet for that paste. Generally, the reflow profile in the documentation is a starting point. That's kind of the fastest cycle you can use if you're trying to make a lot of boards very efficiently. But depending on the thermal mass of your board and the components and the conditions in your oven and your processes, you may need to tweak that. In this case, the default 250 degree lead-free paste cycle that came with this oven is working perfectly. I haven't had to make any changes at all. There's 150, so over the next 100 seconds, it's gonna ramp to 175 degrees Celsius. And this is the soak phase. This should start to activate the flux and, and dry it out so that it's ready, to, um, ready for the solder to melt. Okay, there's 175. It's giving the oven a boost for about 10 seconds. And now it's gonna ramp the oven to 245 degrees Celsius over the next minute. And this is where we should start to see the solder paste starting to kind of bubble and foam a little bit as it all goes liquid right before the solder then hits its liquidest point and wicks up the leads of the components and sucks everything down into position. Now it's holding temperature at 250 degrees Celsius. Just to make sure that everything is reflowed properly. And that's it, servo is opening the door. And that's the end of the cycle. Now it's just gonna cool. Well, I am really happy with how that turned out. Um, this is no clean flux in this solder paste, so I don't have to clean it. I did squirt it with a little alcohol and wipe it off just to make sure that you could see clearly um, and make sure I could see the quality of the joints. And I'm, I'm really happy. Everything has just shifted into position. I've got one transistor here that might be still you know, just ever so slightly crooked. Yeah, yeah, it's not perfect, but um, it's gonna be just fine. Looks like the, the most thermal mass on all the planes over here with the power connector, that's all reflowed well, and everything else looks good. I've looked at it under a microscope, and I'm very happy with how that went. 
Uh, one more sanity check just before I do anything else is I'm just gonna hook up the power and make sure the LEDs come on because if something's terribly wrong, I don't wanna go ahead and put all these components on. And that looks good. I got two LEDs, they're about the same brightness, which means I got the resistors in the right positions and the voltage regulator is working. So that looks good. Let's solder on some through hole components. I think I wanna start with the right angle header. And that just drops in like that and I'm gonna clip it on with a connector just to solder the first pin, just to make sure that we get the spacing off the board correct. This is also lead-free solder that I'm using here. And there's enough mass here, I'm gonna increase the temperature slightly. Maybe 330, Let's see how that goes. This is more difficult with a camera in the way. Okay. Pretty good, next, let me get the uh, connector in here for the servo. Okay, that's nice and flat. I'll tack down the rest or solder the rest of these. Okay, those look great. Now these connectors go in from the bottom and get soldered on top. Okay, just start by tacking down one pin on each. And then I just need to go back and solder them all. Okay, I can live with that. Okay, well I've got the breadboard back out here, but one thing you'll notice is that all the components are cleaned off. I'm just using this as a convenient way to hold the display board and to hold the uh, microcontroller board. Uh, before I hook this up and before I put this board on and test it, I wanted to show you a couple of things about this microcontroller board. Now, if you look at the GitHub project, if you're trying to do this yourself, um, you'll definitely want to check out the instructions in the GitHub project. And there's a couple of things there that I just wanted to point out. There are switches on this microcontroller board, and you can see some of them here. And they all have a little bit of capped on tape over the top of them to protect them from the washing process when this is manufactured. And you have to peel that off in order to change the positions of the switches. And there are a couple of things that you're definitely going to want to change. Um, the reason this board has switches is because it's got lots of different options. You've got lots of GPIOs that go onto all of these pins. But some of those GPIO pins can also be switched to run things like the CAN bus connector down here and the um, encoder inputs. And we actually are trying to use the encoder EQEP1 right here and so we need to set some switches to make sure that's possible. So this is, I believe, let me grab my visor so I can see this. Yeah, so this is S3, 
and S3 has two switches, S3.1 and S3.2, and those both have to be in the zero position. I had to switch those. Then S4 has to be set as well, and that is up here. This is S4, and S4 has to be set to the one position, so you can see I've peeled off the tape and switched that. And the last one is S9, and this is S9 over here, and S9 has to be in the default position, which is one, so I have not peeled the tape off. That just needs to stay default. Uh, the other ones don't matter as much. There's one other thing on this board that's really important to note. If we look up here by the USB connector, you see this white line on the board, and that is an isolation line. So this chip right here is an optical isolator that isolates the debugger connected to the USB port from the electrical bus of the rest of the circuit board. Now, the way I've been running this so far is I've been providing power on this USB connector, and I want that power to power the rest of the board, so these three jumpers right here on these header pins bridge the ground, the 5 volt, and the 3.3 volt power over to this board. But since I'm gonna be providing power through this add-on board that I just made, um, I don't want these on here. So I'll pull those off. So with those jumpers off, this section is isolated. Now, that means a board has to get its power from elsewhere, which it'll get its power from the uh, power connector on this board that I just made, and that'll feed into these pins. But in order to debug, I can still plug a computer in here. The computer will interface across this optical isolator with the debug probe, and I can still debug the microcontroller, but it leaves my computer 100% electrically isolated. The only thing is this uh, capacitor that bridges across it just for noise immunity. So that's the way I want to run it. You definitely do not want to provide 5 volt and 3.3 volt power and leave these connected because there's a voltage regulator here and the 5 volt power will feed back into this part of the board, go through the voltage regulator, and then feed back onto the 3.3 volt rail and compete with the voltage regulator that you're uh, using to provide the 3.3 volts. So I think that's it. Let's go ahead and stick this board on here, wire everything up, and see if it works. I mean, see how it works. Okay, let me mount this board, get all the pins lined up, snap that on. Okay, let's hook up the output to the stepper driver and the cable to the display board. You want to make sure you get this the right way around. Actually, if you connect it backwards um, and reverse the polarity of the connector, it won't actually damage anything. Ask me how I know. So we've got the driver. Oh yeah, we need the encoder. And I just went and grabbed it off the lathe. Make sure that's on the right way. It is. And I think there's nothing left but to connect the power. And lights are on, I see my name, I see the version number, and we're up. Let me connect the stepper. And let's spin the encoder and see what happens. And success. Well, I have to say, I am very relieved to see this working. You, you never really know, right? I had the schematics, they're the same ones that I had wired up on the breadboard, and you know, I designed the PC board, and the design rules all passed, and the boards look good when they came back from the fab, but until you solder it together and you actually try it, you don't know if you're gonna get any ugly surprises. So I'm very pleased with this. Still have not tested the alarm feedback circuit for the servo. This is just the stepper driver, so I can't test that here. And I still have not tested the EEPROM. Um, all that will be coming up in the future. I'll get to that. But for now, I'm very pleased to have a package that I can mount with some 3D printed uh, uh, ISO DIN rail mounts 
on a DIN rail in an EMA enclosure and we can get this thing wrapped up in the shop in a way that'll actually survive going forward. So next time I think we're going to focus on making an enclosure for the control panel. We need to get this in a metal box to protect it and also get some labels on the button so I don't have to keep guessing what button does what. And we'll work on that next time. In the meantime, if you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching. Thank you.